In this video, you are going to learn why we use Kubernetes, how it works, and some of its resources. Without further ado, let's kick off this video. Have you ever wondered how organizations respond to demand from users for more features in their app releases, like normal review and feedback from Google Play Store or Apple Store? As a result of this frequent demand, organizations shift their workload approach to agile methodologies, such as DevOps, by moving from monolithic architecture style of building apps to microservices architecture. Microservices architecture consists of developing software applications as a suite of independent micro applications. Each of these applications, which is called a microservice, has its own fashioning, lifecycle, environment, and dependency. Each of your microservices must only be responsible for a limited number of business rules, and all of your microservices, when used together, make up the application. Take for instance, two microservices of the same app develop in two different languages or as two different functions. Now, let's say that you want to deploy these two microservices inside the same Linux machine. That would be a daunting task. The reason for this is that you will have to install all the functions of the different runtimes dependency and there might also be different functions between the two microservices all these on the same host operating system so the risk of conflict between the dependency is huge uh, the solution to this is you could build a machine image for each microservices and then put each microservices on a dedicated virtual machine so the running instance of this image is called a container but when launching containers in productions there are some specific problem like ensuring high availability handling release management and container deployment uh, auto scaling containers so to solve this we will need a tool to manage this containers problem If you check the official uh, Kubernetes website, you will see something like this. Production grade container orchestration. These four words perfectly sum up what Kubernetes is. It's a container management platform for production, which means it helps to, number one, uh, Kubernetes is natively capable of managing deployment strategies, such as rolling updates, which aim at avoiding surface interruptions. Number two, uh, the ability to adapt your computing power to the load you are facing. This is to meet the requirements of high availability. And number three, your applications should always remain accessible and should never be down. Kubernetes started as an uh, internal project at Google, uh, but was later made public and released in 2014. Kubernetes is no longer maintained by Google. They give Kubernetes to Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, in 2018. Kubernetes has some uh, competitors like uh, Ashikop Nomad, uh, Docker Swarm, uh, Amazon ECX, but it is fair to say that Kubernetes is by far the most popular of them all. Kubernetes is made up of several distributed components, each of which play a specific role in the execution of containers. Having it its own life cycle and they can be scaled without impacting others. As Kubernetes administrator and engineer, to run Kubernetes, you will require Linux machine, which are called nodes in Kubernetes. There are two types of these nodes in Kubernetes. We have master nodes 
also known as control plane, and uh, worker nodes, also known as slave nodes. Master nodes are responsible for maintaining the state of Kubernetes cluster, whereas workers nodes are responsible for executing your containers. Let's take a look uh, into these components. In this table showing the eight major components, you might have noticed that the majority of these components have a name starting with Kube. These are the components that are part of Kubernetes project. The other two components with a name that does not start with Kube, two external dependencies that are not strictly part of Kubernetes project, but which Kubernetes needs in order to work. Let's now dive into what and how each of these components interacts and work in the Kubernetes cluster. kubectl, this is an HTTP client that is fully optimized to interact with Kubernetes and allows you to issue commands to your Kubernetes cluster. kubectl should be installed on any machine that needs to interact with the cluster. Components belonging to the control plane. First, keep API server. These components answer the question of how do we access the cluster. Kubernetes' most important component is REST API called Kube API Server. It is the entry point to Kubernetes. Essentially, this is an API that exposes all Kubernetes features. You interact with Kubernetes by calling this REST API through the kubectl command line tool. Second, etc the uh, database it is necessary for kube api server to store the state of the cluster somewhere such as the number of containers created on which machines the names of the port which image they use etc so to sum up etcd is the database that kubernetes used to keep its state another component is kube scheduler this is a component that is responsible for alerting a worker node out of those available to run a newly created pod. So the kube scheduler component queries kube API server to find unscheduled pods. It then schedules the pod by setting a node name property and updates the entry. Then the pod gets launched on the proper worker node by the local kubelet. You will get to know more about sports and kubelet in this video, so stay tuned. Talking of another interesting component, Kube Controller Manager. It is a binary that run that we call the reconciliation loop. It tries to maintain the actual state of the cluster with the one described in the etcd so that there are no difference between the states. Uh, let's now look into components belonging to worker nodes. First, kubelet is the most important component of the worker node since it is the one that we interact with the container runtime installed on the worker node. Kubelet we had as a bridge between kube API server and the container daemon. Kubelet and the kube API server must be able to communicate with each other through HTTP and because both kubelet and container runtime are running on the same machine, they interface through the usage of Unis uh, sockets. Next, we have kube proxy. This addresses the question of networking in Kubernetes. Kube proxy is one of the mechanisms that expose ports to the outside world or exposing ports to one another in the Kubernetes cluster. Just like the kubelet, the kube proxy component also communicates with the kube API server. Each worker node requires an instance of a running kube proxy so that the pod running on them are accessible. Also, we have container runtime. It is uh, responsible for running container image. It isolates the container's resources from the host and provides a secure and isolated environment for the container to run in. The container runtime pulls image from a registry, creates container from this image, 
it starts run stop and deletes uh, the containers the container runtime is also responsible for enforcing the resources limits that are specified in kubernetes port configurations just like in managing any other applications where your apps leverage on some resources to work effectively like the application code itself third-party apps like database services load balancer volume environment variables so also in kubernetes context we have the following layer of abstraction on top of these resources like board services deployment replica sets persistent volume network policy stateful set to name just but few so let's look into what and how each of these kubernetes workload actually works ports port is the central api resources for running an application in a container which is the smallest unit in kubernetes is basically an abstraction over container also same ports are capable of managing multiple containers at once for instance when the containers are supposed to work together you can group them into a single port next we have replica set this is api resources that control multiple identical instances of a port running the applications so it is called replicas it has the capacity of scaling the number of replicas up or down on demand also we can create a relationship between two containers to have them share a directory through volume volumes are not in modern storage attached to the life cycle of the pod so technically as soon as the pod is deleted the volumes that were created with it also deleted too it is common to encounter an application that evaluates environment variable to control its runtime behavior for instance the app may define an environment variable that points to url of an external service or it co-injects an api key used to authenticate with another microservices here both config map and secrets resources define a set of key values pair and can be injected into a container as environment variable or mount as a volume this leads me to the next question how do we create storage that are not bound to the life cycle of a port a persistent volume so persistent volume represents a pieces of storage that uh, you can attach to your port that pieces of storage is referred to as a persistent one because it is not supposed to be tied with the life cycle of a port another question is why and how will you want to expose your port to understand what service are we need to know that each port created in your cluster as it is unique and dynamic api addresses assigned by kubernetes so meaning that if port gets deleted and recreated for some reasons then your script is broken and any application that needs to communicate with it will no longer be able to call it because the ip assigned will resolve nothing right so the solution to this issue is that kubernetes introduced the usage of the service they are not meant to be destroyed and they recruited often they are meant to act as a proxy in between in fact they are the core object for networking and load balancing in kubernetes so let's talk of deployment what actually is deployment this abstracts the functionality of replica set and manages it internally so in practice this means that you do not have to create or modify or delete replicas objects yourself we also have stateful set they are meant for managing stateful applications like database by a set of ports so it is similar to deployment the stateful set defines a port template however each of its replicas guarantee a unique and persistent identity note that i just 
mention few resources. There are many other API resources that was not mentioned in this tutorial, like horizontal port, autoscaler, ingress, service account, rule, rule binding, persistent volume claim, storage class, you know, and a few others. Also, as your clusters grow, it is going to become more difficult to maintain the ever increasing number of resources that are managed in your cluster. So the need for namespace is necessary. But the idea of this tutorial is to introduce you to the basic resources you need to start running your Kubernetes. Maybe I will try to do more tutorials on these resources in the future. Kubernetes, as believed by some, is seemingly hard technology to master. And just like Emily Dixon said, and I quote, Beware, be very careful of what you wish for. That being said, this video is the first part in the series of Kubernetes in 10 minutes. In the coming days, I will bring you more interesting videos on Kubernetes on your way. So stay tuned. If you are new to my channel, please go ahead and subscribe. This will encourage me to keep on recording videos like this and I will also appreciate your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, you can learn more about DevOps and Cloud in our growing community on Slack. Check out the link in the description below. Uh, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.